Hi. I love a good German Pilsner. I just do. I mean, I love English bitter too, but I do like this beer. Takes me on to another little German story. Well, it's related to Germany. In the days when we were all playing those wonderful German clubs, star clubs, top ten, all those places, uh, there was a little financial dodge became apparent to some musicians <laughs> who took great advantage of it. Now back in those wonderful days, late 60s, Germany still had the Deutschmark. England, of course, had the pound the same as it does now. Uh, in those days, the pound bought you a lot of Deutschmarks. One pound would get you ten Deutschmarks. Towards the end of the Do Deutschmarks uh, life, you're lucky if you got three to a pound. Anyway, those were the days we got ten. Now the Deutschmark was broken up into a hundred pennies, Phoenix, and uh, little little coins. Just they were always in your change, useless, you know. But somebody worked out that the two Fennec piece was almost identical in weight and size to an English sixpenny piece in old money before decimalization came along. Now if I changed a pound in the bank in England, for that pound I would get 40 sixpenny pieces. That's the way the old money worked. We had 240 pennies to a pound, 20 shillings to a pound, uh, 12 pence to a shilling. It was, it was gloriously ridiculous. But anyway, that's what happened. If you changed a pound, you'd get 40 sixpences. Now, if I took that pound in Germany, 10 Deutschmarks, and I took it to the bank and got two Fennec pieces, well, I would get 500 coins. So what used to happen, and I'm not saying I did this, that would have been terribly wrong. The guys would go back to England after three or four weeks in the clubs, loaded down with bank rolls of these two Fennec pieces. And occasionally you'd be playing a place which had slot machines, one-armed bandits. Now you work out. You go to the bar and you change your pound, you get 40 sixpences, because they had, had hundreds of them there because that's what went into the machines, that's how they made a lot of money. So it looked like you'd invested in the machine. But what you did, you quietly put your two Fennec pieces in instead of the sixpences. And every time you got paid out, ching, ten sixpences, that went in one pocket, and another two Fennec piece came out and went in the machine. Well if you work out that the, the two Fennec pieces were worth a twelfth of what a sixpence was worth. That meant for every one go you get for a sixpence, you got twelve plays. This changed the odds in your favour considerably. Uh, and back in those days, there wasn't a great deal of regulation. So the guys who ran these machines, they'd taken the percentage payout as low as they could get it. Um, so let's say both sides were not playing <laughs> exactly with a straight back. Um, so that's what would happen, you know. And some of these machines in the clubs who had a jack up to 25 pounds. Well, back then that was uh, the sort of money that uh, a lot of people were earning for a week's work. So even if you didn't hit the jackpot, you might invest two pounds and walk away with 10 pounds. That was good business. Uh, <laughs> not right, we know it's not right. but. Uh, I reckon lots of guys came back and bought their, bought their girlfriends and wives presents with the money that they never earned from being on stage. It came out of those machines. And I'd love to have seen the, the guys' faces who owned the machines when they came out in the morning to see what the take had been the night before. And finally a big pile of crap, all these useless little German coins falling out of the machine. Anyway, I don't think any of them ever went out of business because of that. Uh, but that was one of the little 
dodges that happened back then. Yes. Oh, I told you it was good. Uh, this little story is from either the first US tour or a, or a tour in 1969-70. I can't remember. It's a long time ago. Um, so it was either with Rod and Nick in Mark 1 or Roger and Ian in Mark 2. Anyway, not really important. That's not the, the point of the story. Uh, we were playing uh, I think it was Worcester, Massachusetts. It was definitely on the eastern seaboard, right on the coast, in a big club. And this club was right on the waterfront. And we were due to open the night's entertainment for Sly and the Family Stone, who once again never showed up. Um, so the promoters just said, hold on guys, hold on. We don't, we're going to work out what we're going to do here. We didn't know whether to cancel the night because we were still pretty new there and uh, Sly was a big name. I uh, said, so look, we're going to work out whether the people will accept Sly not coming and wait for you to come and do a full set instead of the 45 minutes, whatever we were contracted to do, and see how it works. So just hold on for a while. <laughs> so we were in this a big club, admittedly. Even so, there was uh, there were no smoking bands in those days and the place was it was turning into a fog in there with all this clouds of stuff in front of you. Some of it was tobacco, but most of it was weed. Uh, so staying in there for too long was not, not really a great idea if you're going to work later. Um, so Richie said, look, I'm going outside for some air. And he said, OK. And he was right about 10 or 15 minutes later. We followed him because it was impossible to stay in there. Even in the dressing room, this fog was billowing th through the door. Uh, and we thought, Richie was just riding around on this old bicycle, this old push bike. Well, we didn't think too much about it because he had a thing about these old push bikes. He, there's, there's quite a few pictures of him uh, from different periods of time sitting on these terrible old bikes. So we just thought, oh, just Richie riding a bike. He was going round and round in circles. And there's this young kid there, just looking in, in the window. You could see into the club from outside. And Richie went, what are you doing? He said, oh, I wanted to come see Purple, but I got, I got no money, so I've just got to stand outside and listen. <coughs> and Richie <laughs> rode around another couple of circles, came back to the kid and said, uh, do you want to make 20 bucks? And the kid said, yeah, how? He said, I want you to get on this bike, go back there as far as you can, then pedal as fast as you can, and go into the water. I <laughs> kid you, what? Yeah. If you got on this bike and pedal it in as fast as you can, uh, I'll give you 20 bucks on board. And you could, when you, really? He said, yeah. And the kid looked around at us and was sort of saying, is he good for it? We said, yeah, it's all right. So I give me, oh, show me the twenty dollars. So Richie peeled off a twenty dollar bill and said, "There it is. There it is." Kid went, "Okay then. You sure?" Richie said, "Yeah, a bit of fun." So the kid went right to the back of the parking lot, started pedalling as fast as he could, and he hit the edge of the wharf there and sailed out a good twelve, fifteen feet before he crashed into the into the water with a huge splash. About ten seconds later, he comes swimming up, and climbs up the ladder, and gets out. And there she goes. There you are, man. There's your twenty bucks. The kid says, "Great, we've got to get dry now." And he goes, "And the kids, but well, what about your bike, man?" Richie said, "It's not my bike." True story. Cheers.